Hey everyone, it's that festive time of the year. So what have I got for you to get you into the Christmas spirit? Let's see. Gore, nudity, prejudice, and lots and lots of murder. But I mean, hey, it's got some snow in it, so I guess it's pretty Christmassy, right? Blue Eye Samurai is an adult animated series on Netflix, which follows the journey of Misu, who is a mixed race swordsman on a bloodthirsty quest for vengeance against her white father, willing to take out anyone who gets in her way. The story is set in Japan during the 1600s, which during this period, Japan had closed off its borders to the rest of the world, and as such, the average citizen in Japan would never see a face that wasn't Japanese, and if any foreigners were found, they were seen as impure, less than human, like a demon or a monster and so would face extreme prejudice and discrimination. Not just being verbally mocked by other people, but also mistreated and even killed. So enter our main character, Misu, who is a mixed race individual, being half Japanese and half white, given her distinctive blue eyes, which she must hide away from the public's eye. All her life, Misu has had to hide away from society, being mocked and hunted down by the people around her and so she now seeks revenge on her unknown father, who is one of the four white men who were known to have existed in Japan at the time, and she now wishes to kill him for making her the way that she is. Because Misu has been so demonized her whole life, she actually believes that she is in fact the monster that people see her as, incapable of having any friendships or being able to fall in love. And so rather than seeking vengeance on the population for their oppression towards her, she would rather set out to kill her unknown father for simply bringing her into existence. But it's not just being mixed race that holds Mitsu back, but the fact that she's also a woman, as during this time in Japan's history, women didn't have many opportunities and were either arranged to be married or made to work in the sex industry. And so Mitsu not only has to conceal her race, but also her gender. Oh, and uh, fun fact, the series directors of this show Amber Noisumi and Michael Green, they are not only husband and wife, but were actually inspired to create the story from their own mixed race daughter. Now, with all of this in place, I did have concerns that the character Mitsu could very easily become a Mary Sue, similar to the other strong female characters, such as Rey, Captain Marvel, or Disney's Mulan remake, who are able to accomplish insane achievements with very little effort or training put into them and whose only flaws seem to be the people around them who hold them back. But Misu is actually a really well written character. We see the struggle she's had to face her whole life and what has led her to this fury and determination. We see the years of training she's had to undergo in order to master her combat skills. As after her home is destroyed by locals, Misu seeks shelter with a blind sword maker, who takes her on as his apprentice. When other samurai come along to have their swords made, the swordmaker asks them to show off their fighting style so he can craft the perfect blade for them. This allows Misu to witness the other samurai's techniques that she can then use for herself. But even with all this knowledge in hand, she doesn't master her techniques right away. And even when it comes to making swords, there are many trials and errors she has to go through before finally getting it right. But with her motivation for vengeance still there, she is determined to master her craft in hope that one day she'll be able to create a sword of her own and fight her way to her unknown father. Despite this determination though, the series doesn't try to justify her lust for blood, as characters are constantly telling her that revenge is not the correct path, and we see how she's willing to spill the blood of the innocent in order to fulfill her quest. One subtle moment is when Misu is sneaking through a building and a bird flies past her. In order to not have her cover blown, she kills the bird and places it back into its nest, where it's revealed to have four unhatched eggs. Misu is also shown not to be indestructible, occasionally getting injured in battles and needing help from the people around her, all of which makes her a badass character, but also a flawed and empathetic one. And you really do want her to succeed, not necessarily in her mission, but just to be able to find peace. Then we have Akemi. Akemi is a princess who is arranged to be married to the Shogun's son. She doesn't like the idea of having to go through an arranged marriage with a man she's never met, so rebels against everyone and sets off to find the man she does love, but to whom her father doesn't approve. However, her viewpoint is constantly challenged, such as with her only friend in the palace, 
who even though cares very much for her, explains that due to the lack of rights women have, this really is the best option she has. She also meets other women who have worked in prostitution, and when she tells them of the reason she ran away, they kind of mock her, as the problems that Kimmy presents to them seem trivial compared to the hardships they have to face. And because of this, Akimi doesn't come across as a whiny character, as she quickly learns and adapts to the obstacles around her. Being able to have access to literature when growing up has given her a lot of knowledge and wit, and she'll use this to get herself out of tricky situations. Then we have Ringo, who is the comedy relief character, and he's kind of like Perito from Puss in Boots The Last Wish, in that when we first meet him, he comes across as a little bit annoying. But his kind-heartedness works well against the other hardened characters, and he soon proves his worth in the story. Along with the fact that he was born without hands, shows that he's clever, resourceful, and is quickly able to disprove the assumptions of people around him that believe he is useless. Then we have Tygon, who was actually one of the children who used to frequently mock and bully Mitsu in her childhood. And when he meets her again, he's on a quest to kill her in a duel in order to restore his honour for how she mocked him at his temple. And because of this, you think Tygon is going to act as the antagonist of the series, but you see there's actually more to his character than first thought. He doesn't simply kill Misu when he has the chance, as he would find it to be too dishonourable, and so wants her to recover to full health so he can truly defeat her in battle, during which the two begin to bond as they have to overcome challenges in battle together, forming a mutual respect for one another which causes Tygon to begin questioning his previous actions towards her. Now I know the way I described the show earlier, you think it's going to be a constant unapologetic bloodfest. And don't get me wrong, it has those moments, but a lot of it is simply characters just exchanging dialogue. Walking and talking. Walking and talking. Walking and talking. Oh hey they're sitting in this scene. But because the dialogue is sharp, and the characters are so well written, it never feels like it drags or becomes boring. And surprisingly, for a show that is as dark as this, the humour actually holds up too. She's good. As for the animation, this is also pretty top tier. I'm not usually a fan of this 3D CG mixed with a 2D anime aesthetic style, as I don't think it tends to blend too well, the Godzilla Netflix series for example, but here I actually think they did a pretty decent job with it. They made good use of the 3D with the dynamic camera angles being used during fight scenes, and there were also elements of 2D animation incorporated. And occasionally, there were even some swap ups in the style altogether. Episode 6 in particular gets really creative in places. The backgrounds for this show look absolutely stunning. From cold wintry forests, to spring trees in bloom, to a city in flames. So many moments in this series, I just had to pause at the screen so I could truly appreciate them. As for the music? Yeah, overall it's really good too. The score is a nice blend of classical and traditional Japanese instruments, but there are a few scenes where you get a modern song number randomly thrown in, and it's just kind of like... Huh? felt a little like the Super Mario movie where you had a really nice orchestral score and then suddenly a random 80s song appears. But hey, at least they managed to fit in a classic Wilhelm scream. Now this is the part where I'm going to be talking some spoilers, so if you don't want to hear them, click off the video now, but I do recommend checking out the show. Alright, here we go. I was kind of disappointed of how we never actually found out on how Misu managed to melt down the meteorite metal for her sword. I thought it was going to be that she discovers how to create a blue flame in order to reach higher temperatures to melt it, and that the blue flame could also be symbolic of her blue eyes, but no, I guess not. The end of episode 4 where Misu snaps that girl's neck? Man, I was not ready for that. Episode 5, probably my favourite in the series? I loved this episode where we got to explore more of Misu's background. It was actually an interesting insight to see how she had put her vengeance to one side, settled down with her husband and seemingly found peace, but then glimmers of her lust for battle would begin to bleed through as she gets too carried away in a friendly sparring match with her husband, who then becomes fearful of her. And then when she's ratted out, I like how we never actually find out which of the two did it. 
Was it her husband who did it out of fear? Or was it her mother who somehow got the money for her drugs? Having that uncertain answer shows Misu and us the audience that she really can't trust anyone as the two people she once thought she could potentially broke that. And so when we cut back to present day and she decides to go it alone, we understand why. I'm honestly so happy to see that the show has already been given the green light for a second season, and I'm interested to see how the world setting will be explored. Because despite being half white, Misu has been so indoctrinated by the cultural view that all other races are inferior, I want to see how she'll cope with being put in London and seeing other white people. Because admittedly, I was a little disappointed that her potential father was also a colossus dick. I think it would have been more interesting if he was actually a pretty decent person and could perhaps challenge Misu as to whether she wants to actually kill him. Maybe they'll do this with her other potential fathers, or maybe we'll get a further insight into Fowler's messed up childhood to explore more of his character. I really hope so. But until the next one guys, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Take care.